How does Gaza compare to all the other humanitarian nightmares you've covered, you've had to tackle? People are nowhere to flee. They are just uh, waiting for their turn uh, to be killed. Is the media doing better or worse in covering Trump? This is the same man, Donald Trump, who accused all of us in this ecosystem as being the enemy of the people. That's Stalin's words, right? The simple logic of eight years ago, put Trump on TV and more people will watch. We've moved past that. He's become boring. Who do you blame? for the way in which the United States left Afghanistan, Trump or Biden? The US administrations before 2001 ignored Afghanistan for a decade, and we saw 9-11. Once again, they're ignoring Afghanistan. This time, it's going to be much worse. Welcome to Mehdi Unfiltered here in Washington, D.C. I'm Mehdi Hassan. On today's show, we bring Afghanistan back into the spotlight as I speak to one of the key figures in the anti-Taliban resistance movement. We'll also debate why the U.S. media is so ill-equipped to cover the Donald Trump phenomenon again. But first, in an exclusive interview, I'll speak with UNRWA chief Philip Lazzarini about Israel's attacks on the Palestinians and on his own U.N. organization. So, what are we waiting for? Let's go. Israel does not discriminate in its bombing of Gaza. Men, women, children. Hospitals, mosques, churches. But their attacks in the last few months do seem to be showing a preference. Schools. Last week, at least four people were killed and 18 were injured as a result of an Israeli strike on the Salahuddin school in Gaza City. But that wasn't the first school attack this month. It was the ninth, with one of those attacks killing more than 100 people. And this isn't uncommon for the most moral army in the world that has bombed more than 500 schools since the war began, many of them run by the same organization, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA. Since the start of the war, 70% of UNRWA's schools in Gaza have been hit, 539 people sheltering in them have been killed, and more than 289 aid workers, 207 of whom worked for UNRWA, have also lost their lives to Israeli bombardment. Now, Israel's attacks on UNRWA aren't limited to its staff or its infrastructure or the people they shelter. Israel also attacks UNRWA's credibility again and again. In January, the Israeli government alleged that 12 out of UNRWA's 13,000 staff members in Gaza participated in the October the 7th attack. And despite providing little to no proof, the allegations prompted 16 UN member states to cut their funding to the main relief agency for 2 million people living in the Gaza Strip during an ongoing genocide. Seven months later, Israel is still adding names to that list. Its Ministry of Foreign Affairs sent UNRWA's chief, Philip Lazzarini, the names of 108 UNRWA employees it alleges to be working as quote-unquote terrorist operatives and demanded that those employees be terminated immediately. The Israeli government even adds that plenty more names from UNRWA will be shared in the future. Joining me to discuss Israel's accusations and the humanitarian crisis they are causing in Gaza is UNRWA's Commissioner General, Philip Lazzarini. Philip Lazzarini, thank you for joining me on Mehdi Unfiltered. Uh, before we get into all of this, I want to ask you about the current humanitarian situation in Gaza. You commented on last week's attacks on one of UNRWA's schools by tweeting, Gaza is no place for children anymore. How bad have things gotten? as we approach the one-year mark for this ugly war? Well, I believe uh, Gaza is just becoming unlivable. I mean, you heard uh, since last week that there have been, again, a new number of uh, evacuation order. Um, basically, people are just uh, pinballs. They are moved from one place to the other one, depending on the advancement of the military uh, operation. And basically, in uh, Gaza, people are just uh, daily facing either death or disease or hunger. Um, I don't know how much worse it can become. I have to say we we are losing and we, we are lacking words to describe uh, the situation. In the past, I many times said that uh, uh, Gaza is a war of uh, all the superlative. When you look at the level of uh, destruction, number of people having been killed, the number of people uh, being moved, the artificial hunger, which has also been uh, created there, and now you look at uh, uh, the uh, disease uh, spreading in the Gaza Strip. 
And the UN Secretary General released a statement last week on the polio outbreak in Gaza that threatens the lives, the health of more than 640,000 children under the age of 10 there. He said that without a ceasefire, or at least a pause in the fighting, a successful vaccination campaign is impossible. How do you vaccinate 600,000 children while Israeli bombs are falling? Well, as the Secretary General said, we need a humanitarian pause, we need a vaccination, a polio pause, to make sure that we can cover all the children under the age of 10. Um, otherwise, as you said, it will be extraordinarily challenging to reach them out, and that would also mean to take the risk to fail our campaign, and that would be a disaster, not only for the people in Gaza, but as you know, this is a communicable disease which doesn't know any border and could also spread in the entire region, including in Israel. Um, you haven't been allowed into Gaza for several months now by the Israelis. Why do you think that is? I've been allowed to go to Gaza since uh, January, and I do not have a visa to go to my headquarters in uh, Jerusalem since uh, the end uh, of uh, June. I believe that uh, one of the reasons behind this uh, is to put the pressure uh, on uh, the agency. You know that there are a lot of calls from the Israeli authorities uh, to dismantle uh, UNRWA, and this is certainly one way to put also pressure on the organization. Philip Lazzarini, last month, Israel accused 108 of your staff members at UNRWA of being, quote, terrorist operatives. What does that mean exactly, and what evidence, if any, did they present to you? Well, Mehdi, as you know, already in January, we had uh, 12 staff uh, who have been accused to participate to the October 7 uh, massacre. Uh, since we had an internal investigation conducted uh, by an independent body of the United uh, Nations, which concluded its work at the end of uh, July, for which basically half of the people uh, have been proven uh, without uh, uh, evidence, uh, and other people, uh, basically, it was said that uh, if we would be in a situation to corroborate uh, and authenticate uh, the uh, information, we might be in a situation where they might have uh, participated to the October 7. Regarding the list of the 100, uh, this is one allegation among others. We take them all very seriously. And basically, we are asking the Israeli authorities uh, to share uh, information with the organization in order to assess if yes or not, uh, we can undertake uh, an investigation. Were you aware that Israel was gathering this new list, that they were planning to share it the same week as your pledging conference for funds in New York? Do you think the timing was intentional, perhaps, to try and undermine your organization? Well, I do believe that, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, coordinated uh, action. Most of the time when the agency has uh, a donor uh, conference, uh, we have a new allegation being made public. But the one you are referring to uh, basically came out already in uh, February, if I remember well, uh, at the Munich uh, Security Conference. Uh, there was a full dossier uh, being distributed by the member states uh, talking about uh, basically list uh, of uh, staff uh, uh, allegedly being a member of uh, the Hamas or the Jihad, uh, or list of uh, 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 staff uh, having uh, sympathy. But since then, nothing more has been shared. Last week, the Wall Street Journal published a letter from UNRWA responding to Israel's allegations from earlier, earlier this year, the ones you mentioned, uh, accusing first 12 UNRWA employees, then seven more, a total of 19 of participating in the October 7th Hamas attack. The UNRWA letter from your organization said, quote, the Commissioner General of UNRWA terminated the contracts of employees despite the lack of evidence. He did it to protect the agency's ability to deliver humanitarian assistance in Gaza and elsewhere. Looking back, Philip Lazzarini, do you still stand by your decision to terminate the contracts of 10 aid workers on the UNRWA payroll in Gaza when you didn't have any evidence given to you by the Israelis at the time? Your critics would say that just made UNRWA look more guilty than innocent. I would disagree, and uh, we have been under heavy critics uh, because of the lack of uh, due diligence. And my response uh, at the time was, uh, we will undertake a, a due diligence, but a reverse due diligence. It was in the interest of the agency at that time to terminate uh, the contract of the staff allegedly having participated 
to the October 7 attack. The allegations were so horrible, and if that would have been the case, would constitute such a betrayal to the Palestinian in general, but also to the agency, that I had no other choice than to take uh, such a bold decision. But in parallel, uh, the Secretary General has uh, initiated an investigation on this uh, allegation. And in parallel, we have also commissioned a total review of the risk management uh, system of the agency, which is a famous report which has been uh, delivered by the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Catherine Colonna. I believe that independent review that you mentioned found that 10 of the 19 staffers accused by Israel uh, between January and April were cleared due to the absence or the lack of evidence against them. Have any of them been re-employed by UNRWA since? Well, they have been cleared on this uh, allegation, but we still have the allegation that they might uh, be member of the armed group. Uh, and before taking a final determination, we need also to look into this, because as you know, uh, UN uh, United Nations policies are very clear. You cannot uh, be a member of uh, UNRWA and at the same time being a member of uh, an armed group. The review you mentioned from April also found uh, that Israel didn't express any concerns around any UNRWA staff uh, going back to 2011. These are all very belated concerns that the Israelis are raising. But the review did outline several recommendations to address the topic of neutrality within your organization. One of the issues they raised, and which a lot of people, a lot of reports, as you know, have raised in the past, is the issue of the textbooks in UNRWA schools in Gaza, which are not just considered to be biased, but have been accused of inciting violence, of glorifying martyrdom. Do you accept that's an issue? And if so, what steps are you taking to address that? Well, first of all, I'm very proud of our education system here in uh, the region. As you know, we have uh, more than half a million girls and boys uh, attending our school across uh, the region. We are the only one in the region having a proper human rights uh, curriculum. Uh, we are teaching uh, a tolerance uh, in our school, and we have also reached uh, gender parity before anyone else here in uh, the region. Now, as you know also, we are living in a region uh, deeply uh, divided, uh, where emotions are very high. And uh, basically, we have an Israeli narrative and a Palestinian narrative. And obviously, as a UN and UNRWA, we cannot uh, overcome this two uh, narrative in the absence uh, of a political solution. So meanwhile, it is true that uh, there are issues in the textbook, which, by the way, are curriculum from the Palestinian authorities, uh, for which stories are told through the, uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, narrative, uh, contested by the Israeli. But fortunately, as a United Nations organization, we have the narrative of the international community and the United uh, Nation. And this is what is being taught in our schools. And on the subject of those schools, Israel has bombed a lot of those schools, including last week, killing a lot of uh, families, sheltering within them, kids there. Um, how shocked have you been to see how casually Israel and the United States, which is backing Israel, has disregarded international humanitarian law when it comes to protected sites like schools? I express myself many times. It's absolutely shocking, this uh, routine, blatant disregard uh, of uh, the United Nations, of the international humanitarian law. If you look at Gaza, the number of uh, UN staff uh, being killed, the number of uh, premises uh, having uh, been uh, destroyed, number of people killed while in these uh, premises, the number of convoys uh, being uh, targeted. Uh, the, there is a routine, blatant disregard of uh, the humanitarian organization and of uh, IHL. But beyond that, uh, we have also the political attack uh, against uh, the uh, agency, the call for the dismantlement of the agency, the legislative effort at the Knesset uh, to label the organization as a terrorist uh, organization. And uh, this would be absolutely unbelievable. A UN member state uh, labeling a UN uh, organization as a terrorist organization, an organization having a mandate from all the other member states, uh, member of the uh, General Assembly. This would be absolutely 
unprecedented. But let's do no mistake. It's not just an attack uh, on uh, UNRWA. It's an attack on the broader UN system. It's an attack on the multilateral system. Um, it's an attack uh, on all those uh, who are promoting a different uh, narrative, all those supporting, in fact, uh, the, pass, uh, the political path uh, of a two-state uh, solution here in the region. You mentioned the attempt to uh, label UNRWA a terrorist organization. At least three bills are in the Knesset, in the Israeli parliament, aiming to shut down your organization in Israel as a terrorist group. Um, to your knowledge, does Israel have an alternative for UNRWA if those bills were to pass, if they succeeded in shutting you down? If UNRWA didn't exist, what would be happening to the Palestinians in Gaza right now? What is the alternative? Well, the real question is, uh, who would take over, for example, the education of uh, the girls and boys uh, live, uh, deeply traumatized, living in the rubble in uh, Gaza today? We talk about 600,000 girls and boys uh, 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 from the uh, primary and secondary uh, school age. There is no one else beside the uh, UNRWA except uh, a functioning government, functioning administration, which can provide education at scale to such a number of uh, children. Now, the more we wait, uh, the more we will be sowing uh, the seeds uh, for more hatred, revenge, and violence in the future. So, no, I do not see who else can step in and take over the um, activities of the agency. Philip Lazzarini, I think it was 16 countries that cut funding to your organization when Israel made those uh, accusations against your staffers back in January. All of them have resumed their funding, I believe, except the United States. What is your message to President Biden and to Vice President Kamala Harris, who is currently running to succeed him? Well, the United States has been a long-standing partner of uh, the agency, has been until now the first uh, uh, um, pr financial provider uh, to the agency. And I really hope uh, that in the absence of a political solution, support to UNRWA will continue, because otherwise uh, it will be perceived uh, by uh, the Palestinian as a disinterest or an international community turning its back uh, to a proper, lasting political solution. Do you agree with the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, who, like many humanitarian aid agencies, has accused Israel of blocking aid going into Gaza? He's also said Israel is using starvation as a method of war. Well, clearly, the assistance is not commensurate to the need. We are daily struggling to bring assistance into the Gaza Strip. And I have been on record more than once. Uh, we have been in a situation where hunger has been created artificially in uh, the Gaza Strip. Uh, this is a region which, uh, before this war, never really encountered hunger, except uh, in a war situation or in situation where siege was imposed uh, on the Strip. You say hunger has been artificially created. At the start of this interview, you said Israel has made Gaza unlivable. Is what we are seeing in Gaza, then, in your view, a genocide? Well, the, this will uh, leave the uh, ICC and the ICG to determine the, the qualification of what happened. But what I can say is that uh, there have been unprecedented uh, suffering inflicted to the population. As I said, this has been the war of all the superlatives. Uh, look at the number of uh, people killed, the number of children killed, uh, the level of uh, displacement, constant displacement, what the about hunger, war the crimes, diseases. Philip Lazzarini, if it's not genocide, do you agree that attacking UNRWA schools is a war crime? I, I do believe we need an uh, investigation, and indeed it would uh, constitute, uh, constitute as a war crime. I am not the legal or the judge who will label it as war crime, but I do believe that uh, this blatant uh, uh, violation of uh, IHL uh, might constitute a war crime. Philip Lazzarini, prior to heading up UNRWA in 2020, you worked, I believe, at the Red Cross, at the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, uh, at the UN Development Programme. You've spent decades in this field, in conflict zones around the world. How does Gaza compare to all the other humanitarian nightmares you've covered, you've had to tackle? Well, first of all, 
it's a war taking place in an area where people are nowhere to flee. And this is quite exceptional. There is a no border to cross uh, and people are constantly on the move. Traditionally, when you are in a conflict situation, you might be pushed once, moved once or twice, you cross a border, but uh, you are settled until the end of the war. This has not been the case in Gaza. If you listen to the people of there, people have been uh, displaced 15, uh, up to 20 times. They have absolutely nowhere to go. But the other element which strikes me is uh, the absence uh, of uh, international uh, media. How is it possible after 10 months to be in such a highly mediatized uh, uh, context uh, that international media are not allowed uh, to see by themselves uh, what is uh, really uh, going on? And that means uh, in this world, there is also a very strong element uh, of uh, 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 propaganda. It's a good point you make about propaganda and about the, the lack of international media, and even though there are many brave Palestinian journalists reporting on the ground getting killed doing so. Uh, obviously, one of the big claims against UNRWA, aside from the fact that some of your staffers may have taken part in October the 7th, even though the evidence hasn't really been provided, the other claim the Israelis make is that Hamas are hiding under your schools, that they've built tunnels under your schools, under your refugee camps, under your office buildings. They also claim that you knew about it. What is your response to that claim? First of all, whenever we had a suspicion in the past that, that there might be a tunnel nearby a premise of uh, the agencies, we systematically, constantly informed both uh, the uh, de facto authority in Gaza, being uh, the Hamas, uh, but also uh, the Kogat uh, being the Israeli authority. So we have been always extremely transparent in whatever we were able uh, to observe or to witness. Secondly, I mean, as a human development organization or humanitarian organization, I do not have the military expertise to look at what's underneath the entire Gaza Strip. And we have obviously discovered or heard about tens, if not hundreds of kilometers of a tunnel in, 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 in Gaza. Uh, very few uh, underneath, uh, if uh, uh, non uh, our uh, school, um, they were always uh, nearby, at least the allegation I have heard uh, uh, until uh, until now. So my point here is to say all this allegation needs to be investigated. First, we need to investigate the killing of the UN staff. We need to investigate uh, all the damages which have been uh, caused and people who have been killed in our premises. But we need also to investigate all this uh, allegation. And this is the reason why I'm calling also for the setting up of a board of uh, inquiry. Last question, Philip Lazzarini. You haven't been able to enter Gaza this year, as you said. When you speak to your staff on the ground in Gaza, the ones who haven't been killed, both Palestinian and non-Palestinian, what do they tell you about what life is like right now for them in Gaza at UNRWA locations that are supposedly protected? But already the last time I went, which was in January, I was uh, struck on how people were just uh, living in a pilot automatic uh, mode and also the absence of light uh, in, uh, in their eyes. Uh, um, it seems the situation has gone even much worse, uh, though it was difficult to comprehend that it could get uh, worse. And uh, today, when I talk to my staff, uh, they are saying that uh, in reality, people today are so re resignated that they are just uh, waiting for their turn uh, to be killed uh, in uh, in the Gaza Strip. And this is uh, absolutely heartbreaking because uh, people have lost uh, faith of a possible uh, better future. Yes, they have. Uh, it's a tragedy. Philip Lazzarini, Commissioner General of UNRWA, thank you for taking time out from Hedy Unfiltered today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Hedy. It was my pleasure. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Our both sides media in this country is just not ready and able to cover Donald Trump's third campaign for president of the United States. It's just not up to the task. It's not fit for purpose. It's broken. And I'm not just talking about the softball questions that he and his acolytes get from reporters and TV anchors or the ridiculous op-ed that the New York Times published this week headlined, Trump can win on character. And no, that's not a headline from The Onion. It's real. 
but I'm also referring to the way in which fact-checkers from our major media outlets are basically acting like apologists and excuse-makers for Trump and the Trump campaign, because they so desperately want to look fair and balanced, even though one side are serial liars and the other side are not. When Joe Biden at the DNC said Trump as president had, quote, created the largest debt any president had in four years, the New York Times called it misleading, because Barack Obama created more debt in eight years. So Joe Biden was right because he said four years. The Washington Post had to correct its own fact check after it tried to suggest Kamala Harris was wrong to say Trump exchanged love letters with Kim Jong-un. I mean, we all heard him say it. The media, as I say, is broken. So how bad is the coverage? Could it affect the election result? And how do we fix it? Joining me now are two of the media's most eloquent critics, in my view, journalist and author Wajahat Ali, who now publishes the Left Hook Substack newsletter, and veteran reporter and author James Fallows, who is chief speechwriter to President Jimmy Carter and publishes the Breaking the News Substack newsletter. Thank you both for joining me on Mehdi Unfiltered. And veteran is a compliment, of course. <laughs> um, I took it that way, of course. <laughs> Jim, is the media doing better or worse in covering Trump than it did in 2016 and 2020? I think grading on the curve, you have to say they're doing worse because eight years ago was the first time. You know, Donald Trump had been around forever in the media, but he'd never run for president before. Now we are seeing just the same things in just the same way, in any, if anything, with more of an air of defensiveness. And, you know, uh, just, you know, we're not going to change. And, and if it were a matter of somebody pointing out to them the error of their ways, uh, you know, the, the Times pitch bot would have done the job over the last couple of years. They know what they're doing, and the Times in particular keeps doing it. I think it is worse this time. Waj, what do you make of these fact checks that the Times and the Post and USA Today and PolitiFact uh, were doing during the DNC? Were they running cover for Trump? And if so, why? Uh, I think it's time for fact checkers to retire for this election cycle. I agree with you. You said uh, the current media system, I would say the corporate media system is broken. And I would add they're not built for this fight and made for this moment. And I want to stress this moment in particular is a moment where those of us, however flawed we may be, try our best to promote democracy. You should be biased in favor of democracy yes. in a democracy where you have the freedom of the press to ask the tough questions. What we're up against is a right-wing authoritarian movement that has openly said that we don't care about the rule of law. This is the same man, Donald Trump, who accused all of us in this ecosystem as being the enemy of the people. That's Stalin's words, right? He accuses us of being fake news. And so you would think the people that he's attacking would say, you know what, if this guy wins, maybe life won't be good for us, but instead they they go up to him, they cozy up to him, they create this both sides false equivalence where you have 32,000 lies and misleading statements of Donald Trump and they're like, but we have to create balance. Yeah, it's, uh, a, cre it's a deliberate creation of balance is yeah, what they're doing at the DNC. Complete asymmetry. And that, there, that's why you have, like you said, this hilarious fact checks where we had a, a one-hour press conference with Trump in Mar-a-Lago where he repeats lies after lies, where Democrats are apparently killing babies in the ninth month. They're not. What can we find with Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz? Oh, he wasn't a coach, he was an assistant coach. Yeah. And, he, and the rest of the world he said... He stopped to yeah. pet a different dog, <laughs> yes. it's not his dog. And you're yeah, not even making that up. That no, was yesterday. yesterday. That's yesterday. Yes. Um, Jim, back in 2016, the then CEO of CBS... Wajahat mentioned corporate media. CEO of CBS, Les Moonves, mm. famously said about the Trump campaign, it may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS. Is that still the attitude, do you think, from corporate media bosses today to Trump and a third presidential campaign? More views, more clicks, more ratings, or is that yeah. too simplistic? Um, I think it is still a factor, but I think there are, in a way, worse aspects than that now because the simple logic of eight years ago, put Trump on TV and more people will watch, we've moved past that. He's become boring, yeah. and many people on his team think it may actually backfire on him to show these things at full length. So it's other sort of cultural things. I, I think the... The structural issue about the major media now that is really problematic is their entire defensiveness and non-transparency. Yeah. Remember back when the New York Times had a public uh, editor, yes. at least that person could ask people who are writing these headlines, writing these social cells that usually have more influence than the story itself and say, why did you do this? Um, you know, why back in the, uh, the 16 campaign did you devote the entire front page a week before the election to James Comey and Hillary Clinton's emails? Why are you portraying what Trump says in an insane, literally insane press conference with a platform from Kamala Harris and saying both sides present clear economic visions? There's a bias towards normalizing yes. things that are objectively crazy. 
yes. and being afraid to say this is crazy, this is outside the normal bounds. And, I mean, also, and also the fact that you're talking about the emails, all of them published the emails. Yes. They decided was, not to publish Trump's I was about to say, yes. well, you know, that's the big question right now you yes. have for a New York Times public editor. What's the reason you're not publishing any of these emails? I mean, you don't have to mass dump them, yeah. but you must have found something interesting in there that's not related to hacking, that's of public interest that you could have shared by now uh, about the, you know, the great man that is J.D. Vance. Can I just get, give a, a, a point there that, that back... It is true that when the earlier emails came out, they were released publicly by Wikipedia, and so people could Wikileaks, find Wikileaks, not Wikipedia. Sorry, 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 sorry. yes, Wiki, <laughs> Wikileaks. Uh, so thank you for real-time fact-checking. Yeah, there you go. Uh, in the spirit of, of uh, Dale, who is, uh, you know, da Daniel, Daniel Dale. Daniel Dale. Who is a good fact-checker. Can we all he, defend Daniel Dale one, one amongst the other, the CNN fact-checker? So yeah. what made the, the, the Wikileaks email so powerful was that all the newspapers adopted them as major stories. They did yes. curated takeouts over the next couple of weeks. That has not happened at all in the other extreme. I, these, I would argue most ones. Americans probably don't know these emails even exist. Yes. Mm. That there are yeah. these J.D. Gordon, uh, J.D. Gordon, J.D. Vance, yeah. they're all <laughs> getting names wrong, uh, released uh, yeah. to um, Politico, New York Times, yeah. and I believe Washington Post, the yeah. three who, yeah. who are sitting on them. Um, what Jim mentioned earlier, the idea that it's worse now because they know better, right? Yeah. They know, and he's talked about non-transparency. Yeah. You have been a contributor to the New York Times. Yes to CNN, you've sat in those studios, in yeah. those green rooms, you've had conversations with uh, print editors at quote-unquote liberal media outlets. Do they just have no self-awareness <sighs> that they're both, effectively giving a pass? <laughs> I'm just wondering, is it, yeah. is it a lack... I, I want to be generous yeah. here. Is it a lack of self-awareness, they just don't realise they're being played, or is it a deliberate <sighs> fake contrarianism? I would say both, but I would say regardless... I'm we not, can't be both. But, to be well, well, let me put it this way. Yeah. Let me put it this way. I'm not God, so I don't know what's in their hearts, but it's been nine years, maybe. It's almost a decade. You have to learn. You have to be agile. You have to adapt. You have to meet the moment. And what we have seen by their deliberate actions is they refuse to meet the moment. Yeah. They refuse to be agile. They seem... They seem... The reason why I say both is, number one... I feel like they had a moment in 2020 where they were, and now yeah. we've regressed to 2016. Well, well because... Well, I'll, t I'll tell you why I said both. Is because... They, they, I think, are incapable of breaking this mold of both sides. Where sometimes you literally are sitting there and you're like, this person is lying. They're like, but we, like, it's like a robot, like Terminator, like Arnold Schwarzenegger just breaking down. We must do both sides. And I always say, you don't have to do both sides. If one side is lying profusely, you have to just be committed towards the truth, be biased towards the truth. The second thing I would say, and I'm so glad you mentioned that Les Moonves quote, because that shows you the North Star of corporate media, which I know might be too cynical. So there's really good journalists, maybe, really good people. We've worked there before. But the North Star is not truth. The North Star is ratings, power, access to power, and money. And that trumps at the end of the day. And what they're betting on is this man, Trump, might actually win. And if he wins, we have to be on his good side because we need to book those guests. Yeah. And I got asked this question about the New York Times, yeah. which gets a lot of, you know, uh, hate on social media from liberals. Uh, but, you know, it's a paper of record mm -hmm. and does seem to be running some really odd stuff. I mentioned the <laughs> intro, the uh, Trump yes. can win on character, which is yeah. not an onion headline. Uh, a lot of headlines, both sides yeah. and, as you say, normalizing the, the abnormal. How come the New York Times, in your view, Jim, sorry to ask you to be God like yeah. why didn't get into their heads, how come it was so obsessed with Joe Biden's age and mental fitness, and yet we have not seen even 10% of the same coverage and intensity given to Donald Trump's manifest mental unfitness for us? And I think this is centers in the Times, but it's true of all the major media that we had over the last year or two, stories about Biden, whether we're in his cognitive fitness to govern. And, of course, after the uh, disastrous debate, that went, went way up. To my knowledge, we have seen either zero or close to zero of those serious stories about Trump where the framing is not, how is this affecting his staying on message? You know, is this getting in the way of his appealing to this, this or that bloke, but, uh, block? But what would this mean for fitness to govern, which was the frame for everything ab about Biden? Um, the, uh, I'm going to give one other comparison about the Times itself. Recall that you, re think back to the days of the Iraq War, and you recall what the New York Times was doing in the build-up to the Iraq War. After that, to his credit, Bill Keller, who was then the executive editor, ran a kind of truth squad of what happened here. How did we get that so wrong? After the but about her emails, what about her emails fiasco uh, eight years ago, Dean Baquet of the New York Times would not entertain any questions whatsoever. They were just following the news. And that seems to have been the instinct that has prevailed, that just uh, we're covering the news, we're, we don't want to get involved in this active but, politicking, and that is so destructive. And, Jim, just a follow-up yeah. on the Times, 
Someone like Michael Cohen, not Trump's lawyer, yeah. the MSNBC columnist, <laughs> former State yeah. Department speechwriter, I often notice he often berates his fellow liberals online, yeah. saying, why are you all obsessing over the Times? It doesn't matter. It's not like Trump voters read the Times. None of this matters. What would you say in response to I would to say that? au contraire in, uh, in two, two layers. Uh, one is, I still think that 95% of what's in the Times is the best journalism there is. Their coverage of science or technology or the rest of the world. If they covered U.S. politics the way they cover everything else, we'd be a lot better situation. Number two, there is still an enormous legitimizing and normalizing and framing power that yeah. the New York Times had. Right. It mattered in the 2016 election that, uh, you know, 10 days before the election, the New York Times devoted its entire front page, with some little exception at the bottom, to Hillary Clinton's emails and what James Comey has said. They still, even Steve Bannon checks them out, even, you know, everybody checks them out. It's a sort of, it is an indicator of which way things are going. So, very few people read it, but a lot of people are influenced by it. I wonder if Bannon gets a physical copy in his prison cell. Um, Waj, you and I are brown people yes. who have joked for a while We turned now. brown. We turned brown. Yeah. We used to be black, we yes, turned brown. Yeah. We're reverse of Kamala Harris. Uh, we have joked for a long time, you and I, going back a decade, that mm. you know, at some point Trump's going to be power long enough to build the camps and uh, we'll be in those camps. Do you think our fellow white liberal journalists at The Post, at CNN, at The Times, at NBC, do they understand, as you mentioned earlier, that they are the enemy for Donald Trump, that he is going to come after them probably before he comes after any other group. He loathes uh, parts of the liberal media, calls them scum, calls uh -huh. them enemy people. His, his bag carrier, Cash Patel, has said openly, we will come after you criminally or civilly. It is not going to be a good life for journalists under a second Trump term. I have a very dark, uh, basically dystopian joke I keep telling for the past nine years that when Trump wins again, he's, there's going to be a camp. The first people that will go in are the immigrants, then Muslims, then black folks, then Republicans, Mike Pence, and then journalists. And we'll all be sitting there in the camps, and the journalists, this, the white liberal journalists from the establishment, they'll have their uh, microphone out from the gates talking to the guards, like, can you give us a scoop? And the, the guard will say, yeah, you're going to die tomorrow. Can I, give, can I have the exclusive? He's like, sure. And I feel like that they have not evolved. They think that they are necessary. They are needed. Trump loves them. We'll be okay. And I keep telling them, you won't be okay. And, and you only have to look at Orban's Hungary or Modi's yeah. India or all the places that Trump looks for inspiration to see how the media fares. Jim, one last question to you. Uh, you've written about this stuff. You've thought about this stuff for a long time. How do we fix our quote-unquote liberal media? Is there an obvious way to right the wrongs that we've been discussing? Uh, short answer, no. Uh, longer answer is, is it's the same thing they say about uh, saving local news. Nothing might work, but everything might work. Mm. And so I think the matter of people continuing to speak up, and just to return to your previous point for a second, speaking as the old white guy here, I think there is a failure of imagination, which I'll equate to how I felt the years I was living in China, that most foreigners, most Americans, most white Americans felt that however dark things got there, it wasn't going to affect us. The worst yeah. that would happen is they'd kick us out. I think that same failure of American, uh, f failure of imagination applies for many liberal white journalists now, that it's hard to sort of make the leap of, oh, you mean us? The jaguar eating, <laughs> jaguar, or the face eating jaguar is coming for us? Yeah. Yeah. But you have one last point to what yeah. he said. Don't, you know, these folks, I know them, they're very fickle. Uh, so don't underestimate the power of mockery and pressure. I never do. Mujahid Ali, <laughs> James Fallows, thank you both for your insights. Appreciate it. I hope uh, some of our fellow journalists are watching uh, at home. Thank you both. Thank you. This August has marked three years since the Taliban returned to power in Afghanistan after the U.S. finally withdrew their last troops under President Joe Biden. And although an end to the endless war was much needed, life for the Afghan people has been far from free or peaceful under the Taliban's rule. Since their takeover, the Taliban has forced the courts to return to an eye-for-an-eye -eye justice system, ordering over 400 public floggings and executions in 2023 alone. Of course, not only are women back to having no education, no freedom to travel, and in many cases, no access to health care, but as of this month, the Taliban also issued a ban on women showing their bare faces in public and reading or singing in public. This clear oppression of women is only compounding the country's growing economic and humanitarian crisis with nearly half of the population living in poverty and over a third of them suffering from severe food insecurity. Now, of course, there was widespread concern for Afghans in the immediate aftermath of the U.S. withdrawal, but that conversation has mostly disappeared from mainstream media as the majority of the world has silently accepted what some have deemed to be the Taliban's inevitable rule. 
what about all the Afghans who ran that US-backed government, the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan? Have they accepted the Taliban's rule after their failed republic was toppled? Not quite. While many of them quickly surrendered to the Taliban back in 2021, others have decided to resist. Again, yes, the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan, the NRF, made up of several members of that fallen republic, have been engaging in on-again, off-again battles with the Taliban for the past three years now. They even managed to maintain control of northern Afghanistan's Panjshir Valley, a province historically known for acts of resistance for several weeks after the Taliban's takeover. The group is led by Ahmad Massoud, son of the legendary anti-Soviet Mujahideen leader Ahmad Shah Massoud, who has called on the West and other countries to support the NRF in their fight against the Taliban's oppressive reign. Joining me now is someone considered to be Massoud's point man in its dealings with the West, Ali Mesam Nazari, head of foreign relations for the NRF. Ali, thanks so much for coming on Mehdi Unfiltered today. Thank you for having me. In 2001, after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the Taliban's takeover was one of the biggest stories of the year. Uh, people were raising money for charities. Uh, people were raising money to help people escape Afghanistan. Um, people have moved on from that story, sadly. Why do you think that is? Uh, and do people just see it as a hopeless situation around the world? You travel around the world. You speak in different capitals to different governments. Are people just fatigued by Afghanistan? Of course, one of the reasons is the fatigue that the international community feels when it comes to Afghanistan after having presence for 20 years. Um, and of course, the situation globally. There's so many conflicts yes. that they're focused on, and Afghanistan has been put aside. And as every day passes, they're putting Afghanistan aside. However, the situation within Afghanistan is once again returning to what it was in the 1990s, becoming a global uh, threats uh, with 21 terrorist groups on the ground, nurturing, being nurtured, supported, and protected by the Taliban terrorist group. While we're the only forces, the National Resistance Front of Afghanistan, fighting 21 regional and international groups today when the world is not paying attention to the rise of international terrorism and extremism inside Afghanistan once so again. I want to come back to the NRF fight on the ground, but before we get there, just for our viewers, just to make it clear, how bad is the situation for women in Afghanistan right now with the Taliban back in charge in complete control? Very grim. Basically, what we see today in Afghanistan is gender apartheid. Women have been erased from public life. Their basic rights have been taken away from them. You mentioned the set of laws that came out last week. That's just one example. But in the past three years, we've seen them every few months coming out with new decrees, new laws, restricting women from partaking in anything, even their basic rights. Look, Afghanistan, for example, just to give you an example, most of Afghanistan's houses lack uh, uh, modern plumbing. They don't have a bathroom. They can't bathe themselves. Women can bathe themselves in, in their houses. They have to go uh, a few times a week or once a week to the public bath. The Taliban have banned women from taking baths to visiting public baths. So they can't fulfill their religious obligations. So a group that uh, calls themselves so-called uh, an Islamic group, uh, an Islamic emirate, they're per per prohibiting women from fulfilling their religious obligations. So this is how bad and bleak their situation is in, inside Afghanistan today. And the world it has turned a blind eye and is tolerating the Taliban or are, are unfortunately engaging with them on a daily basis. Not just a blind eye, some people have criticized uh, the American government for making things worse. In the aftermath of the Taliban's takeover, the Biden administration famously froze $7 billion in funds for Afghanistan out of fear that the money would end up in the hands of terrorist groups. Since then, President Biden has allowed for half of that money to be sought out by 9-11 victims' families. Uh, and the other half to the Swiss-based Afghan fund, which is yet to be distributed inside of Afghanistan. How urgent is it for that money to get to the people of Afghanistan? Is there a way to get it to the people of Afghanistan without it going through the Taliban? And what do you make of this claim by 9-11 families for that money, which is Afghan money? Well, un unfortunately, um, the situation is much more complex. Since August 2021, of course, the United States has sent funds. Uh, U.S. taxpayers have been sending funds it amounts to around 21 billion now. SIGAR, uh, the inspector general, came out with a report uh, a few weeks back saying that the amount that the U.S. has sent to Afghanistan is 21 billion. However, it hasn't reached the people. Yeah. 
And unfortunately, what even Sigar acknowledged is that the Taliban and other terrorist groups have been exploiting this U.S. aid. Mm. The reason is countries like the United States and others in the international community, they're not paying attention that Afghanistan doesn't have a legitimate government. It's in a state of anarchy. A terrorist group made up of different factions have taken over the country. They don't know how to rule a country. And they haven't put an effort to form a legitimate government based on the will of the people that can represent an, a, a Afghanistan and that can alleviate the humanitarian crisis that the people of Afghanistan are facing. This is one thing that we've been pushing, that Afghanistan needs a government that represents its diversity, that represents every single citizen, whether it's men or women, and a government that comes out of the will and, 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 and the, uh, uh, the will of the people and is based on elections, free and fair elections. We cannot depend on the Taliban to receive seven billion, which belongs to Afghanistan's people, and to distribute it. We know where that money is going to go to. So, it's the anniversary of the U.S. withdrawal, August 2021. Um, it was a very popular move to end the war in the U.S., but the way it was done was very unpopular. It hurt Joe Biden in the polls. Right now, Donald Trump is running for president again. He negotiated the withdrawal deal with the Taliban. Mike Pompeo famously met with the Taliban leadership in the Middle East. Um, Trump is blaming Biden. Biden is blaming Trump. Who do you blame for the way in which the United States left Afghanistan? Trump or Biden? Of course, both the agreement and the withdrawal caused a catastrophe. However, after January of 2021, the current administration could have taken a different trajectory. They changed so many Trump initiatives after January 2021. They couldn't have changed the agreement that was signed um, by the Trump administration with the Taliban. They could have done that. <laughs> President Biden himself, from the beginning, even before the agreement was signed, when he was vice president, even before he was vice president, when he was a senator, he was against the U.S. intervention in Afghanistan. So it was a personal decision that he made. It was catastrophic because Afghanistan's government, parties like us, time after time, we warned the implications of a hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan. We weren't against a withdrawal. That's a decision that the United States should have made, and we respected that. Mm. However, it should, be, should have been a dignified withdrawal. It should have been a, been a withdrawal that could have protected Afghanistan's government from collapsing, yet they took decisions that directly caused the collapse of Afghanistan's armed forces, caused the collapse of the government, and created the conditions that we see today. The counter-argument to that is that the government was going to collapse no matter how you did the withdrawal. And the fact that it collapsed so quickly when even U.S. intelligence, U.S. military chiefs were saying it'll take several months for the Taliban to conquer the country, they did it in a matter of days, that tells you, the critics would say, that the government would just never had any support, any popular base, any competent military. So whether you go slowly, whether you go quickly, the end result is the Taliban takes over the country. There's a few reasons to counter this. One is Afghanistan's armed forces bravely fought for years. We lost 80,000 forces from 2014 to 2021. But they didn't fight in August 2021. They collapsed. That's a fact. And the reason they collapsed in August 2021 is because the United States withdrew all the support that could have sustained the armed forces. Look, the armed forces that were, the model that the United States uh, intentionally adopted for Afghanistan's armed forces two decades ago created dependency mm. between Afghanistan's armed forces and US presence in Afghanistan. So the United States didn't put guarantees after its withdrawal for the armed forces to survive. When the armed forces were dependent on contractors, on the United States to maintain its equipment, on U.S. Uh, yeah. advisors. When, when all of these isn't pulled a out from the country, it was, it was uh, and, uh, and, and inevitable there's, there's for, no for, 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 for the collapse. There's no doubt what you're saying, so I wonder, doesn't that make it difficult for you now as a member of the National Resistance from the NRF to say, we want foreign support? Because we've seen this film before, and you yourself are saying it didn't work out the first time. So what would, what would foreign military support for the NRF look like right now, tangible? What, what is it you're looking for from the American government, for example? To make something clear, on August 2021, August 15, 2021, thousands of Afghanistan's armed forces came to the Pineshire Valley in the north and declared the resistance under the banner of the NRF. So not everyone abandoned the fight. And for the past three years, 
without any external support, without a cent going to us, we've continued our resistance, fighting the Taliban. But and my question is, you, you're, you're here in DC. Groups. My question is, do you want external support for the NRF? Of course, for us to defeat regional so international like? so, uh, terrorism, we need the international community to wake up and realize there's a threat inside no, Afghanistan. I I'm asking specifics. Us. What does that look like? You want fighter jets? You want troops on the ground? You want special? What do you, what do you, what do you want? When the Taliban and 21 other terrorist groups have $7 billion worth of U.S. arms, munitions, and equipment, of course we need support, whether it's the United States or any other country, to allow us to defeat them militarily with non-lethal and but lethal weapons. Here's my question, given how what you just described. Wouldn't we, aren't we just repeating the same cycle? Let's say you defeat them, you defeat the Taliban, you take back control, the Taliban doesn't disappear, they become the resistance. You're back, in, back to square one, same American government support, same dependency, and it, we're, this cycle never ends. Well, if you remember in 2001, 2002, of course, many mistakes were made in the beginning. The Taliban were willing to surrender when they were defeated. But the administration back then didn't accept their surrender, and we saw mm. the insurgency for 20 years. But what's the truth, um, Mehdi, is today it's not an internal conflict within Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda is experiencing a resurgence, ISKP. Regional terrorist groups. Look, the, the threat that Pakistan faces. Today. Pakistan was the Taliban's number one sponsor and supporter yeah. for 30 years. But Pakistanis are saying the greatest threat today, what they're saying is the greatest threat to our security and stability is the Taliban. So as long as the Taliban control a country the size of France, not only are the people of Afghanistan no, I, I, facing you don't, you don't a threat, need to but make the, the case against the Taliban. Community. I think we all understand the case against the Taliban. What I'm asking you, though, is you mentioned 2001 and there was a surrender offer. Karzai wanted to do a power-sharing deal with the Taliban. That was what was turned down. Would you guys do a power-sharing deal with the Taliban? If they, were to, if they were to kind of put down their weapons and say, just do a deal? Is the NRF willing to go into coalition with the Taliban? What's different, what we're asking, is different than what happened uh, after 9-11. We're not asking for boots on the ground. We have capable fighters who have shown their capabilities and their determination the last three years to fight. What we need is resources, minimal resources, enable for us to expand our efforts, to conventionally challenge the Taliban and to start liberating the country. It's much different than what happened after 9-11. What about the argument that says Afghanistan is a war-torn country, all you're offering is more war, that in places like the Panjshir Valley, they don't care about either of you, innocent villages are being killed in this fighting. What do you say to that? Well, it, our vision matters, which is different from the Taliban. We're fighting to establish a democratic, decentralized, pluralistic Afghanistan where every single citizen enjoys equal rights because Afghanistan is a diverse country. We have to guarantee equal rights to all ethnic groups, religious groups, and others. That's not what the Taliban are doing. What the Taliban are doing is putting Afghanistan on a trajectory of a, a vicious cycle of violence and, of course, Un uh, unfortunately, the trajectory that the Taliban have put Afghanistan is a trajectory where we face the dismemberment of the country in the future. So, so we are going to see chaos and crisis not only in, inside Afghanistan, but regionally and internationally because of the existence of the Taliban. So but by supporting democratic forces like us, we will allow conditions to come in, so uh, on the ground to end this vicious cycle of violence by guaranteeing the rights of every citizen inside Afghanistan and guaranteeing the security of the region and international community. You say you are a democratic force. Yes. The last Afghan government often said it was a democratic government. It was riddled with corruption. I think no one can deny the last Afghan government was a co pretty corrupt, as was predecessor governments. Um, the NRF, your group, has several members from that former corrupt government who have themselves been accused of corruption. Um, one expert said that your leader, Masood, has turned the NRF into a, quote, family business, wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars on corruption and family feuds. How do you expect the people of Afghanistan to support you, to even trust the NRF, when your group is both the successor to a corrupt government and right now is being accused of being corrupt? Well, before August 2021, the leader of the NRF, myself, and, and the vast majority of our members, we were part of the opposition just because of that. We were against the corruption of Afghanistan's government. We didn't believe that the Constitution would have strengthened democracy. So we were asking for constitutional reform for a more decentralized uh, political system in order for democracy to take root inside the country and to strengthen. To go back to the NRF, of course, those are rumors. The vast majority of Afghanistan's people support us today because 
the leader of the NRF, Mr. Ahmed Massoud, he wasn't involved in the government in the past 20 years. One, he's young, educated, and clean because he doesn't have a crop past in the government. You say he's clean, but Tamim Asse, who's an Afghan expert at King's, I'm sure you know him, former deputy defence minister, he says, princeling Ahmed Massoud and his father-in-law, Ahmed Wali Massoud, have turned the NRF into a family corporate business based out of Tajikistan. He says hundreds of thousands of dollars are lost due to corruption. I, I ask him to bring evidence and mm -hmm. proof. And he, he was a government official. We should ask him what happened to millions who But aren't there many, but, who, but which doesn't that apply to you as well? Then you have lots of former government officials, people like Amrullah Saleh, who was the vice president of Afghanistan, was the interior minister. On their watch, all these officials watch, weren't they like fake ghost soldiers? Weren't they Afghan army units billing the United States for soldiers that didn't exist? All, I mean, you say clean hands, but the legacy of the previous regime is still with the NRF, is it not? No, because we aren't a continuation of the corrupt government. The president fled. Look, Ashraf Ghani, the president, fled. Yes. But didn't Ahmed Massoud also flee to Tajikistan? He, didn't he, they both flee? No, because he went to Panjshir Valley on August 15, 2021. He had no obligation to start a resistance. He wasn't part of the government. No, but he, he wasn't fled, part of the right? Government. Ashraf went, Ghani fled and on, Ahmed Massoud fled. So in, on August 15, 2021, the only person who stayed inside the country, part of the political class, was Ahmed Massoud. Understood, but since then he's left. He left, no, he didn't flee the country. Of course, he's been moving in and out. But right now, the conditions are much better. Since he's the political leader of the NRF, it's much better for him to stay outside of the country. But he stayed on. He fought against the Taliban conventionally himself inside the Panjshir Valley for more than a month. And after that, it was based on a consensus of the people that he consulted with to other senior members of the NRF and our commanders who are still in the field, who operate our bases within Afghanistan, that it's best for the leader of the NRF to leave the country to pursue our diplomatic efforts and our political matters. Okay. Last question to you. You're here in Washington, D.C. What is your message to Joe Biden and the Biden administration? What is your message to Kamala Harris, vice president, who is running to replace Joe Biden, could be in charge of Afghan policy in a matter of months? Well, our message to all Americans, whoever wins the elections in November and the current administration, is the current policy that the West, the international community, has adopted vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan has failed. The Taliban haven't shown any flexibility. They haven't changed. They're making the lives of every single citizen of Afghanistan much worse as every day passes. Afghanistan, once again, is a hub and haven for international terrorism. When you have the leader of the, uh, the new leader of Al-Qaeda, Saif al come out with a statement last month saying Afghanistan was once again safe for us, and so all jihadists and terrorists around the globe should migrate to Afghanistan and then facilitate attacks against the West, why is the White House quiet? Why is both campaigns quiet about this? They should be, Afghanistan shouldn't be a domestic talking point for any campaign right now. It should be part of their national security strategy. What is going to happen when one of them are elected after November? Because Afghanistan, look, the U.S. administrations before 2001 ignored Afghanistan for a decade. And we saw 9-11. Yep. And, and the war on terror. Once again, they're ignoring Afghanistan. This time it's going to be much worse because Al-Qaeda, ISKP, Taliban have an emboldened narrative that we've defeated NATO yeah. and the U U.S. They have $7 billion worth of U.S. equipment. They have a whole country the size of France in their disposal, which they didn't have in the 1990s. We controlled 35% of Afghanistan. We were the yeah. legitimate government of Afghanistan. And so this is, of course, a recipe for, for a catastrophe. So they need a viable policy based on the realities on the ground okay. in order to prevent a catastrophe that will once again create the conditions for a costly war, yeah. that will create the conditions for the return of boots on the ground to Afghanistan. We don't want that. They don't want that. So let's sit down and discuss a viable policy that can help both the people of Afghanistan and the international community. We'll have to leave it there. Ali Nazari, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. you. That's our show. May the Unfiltered will be back next week. In the meantime, do make sure you subscribe to Zateo. For now, from me, goodbye.